And welcome to the second edition, the September edition of the Cinema for the Culture, a signature event of the African Film and Arts Foundation. This month, we screened a series of films celebrating musicians and genres across the diaspora that shaped generations. The films were The Story of Lovers Rock, My Friend Fella, and The Apollo. My name is Mojisola Shunoiki, and I'm the founder and executive director of the African Film and Arts Foundation. So a little bit about the foundation, the African Film and Arts Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit media arts organization based in Atlanta, Georgia. Our mission is to raise the propensities and potentials of African arts and cinema cultures. We aim to promote and support the work as well as changing the narrative of and about people of African descent by leveraging networking, distribution platforms and innovation. Today, we are pleased to have with us the producer of The Story of Lovers Rock, Paulette Harris German, with special guest Floyd Webb. Our moderator for this evening is Sonia Bassel. A little bit about the film, The Story of Lovers Rock, directed by Menelik Shabazz, charts the history of Lovers Rock, often dubbed romantic reggae, created in South London in the late 70s and 80s against a backdrop of riots, racial tension and sound systems. Filmmaker Menelik Shabazz, husband, father, mentor, trailblazer, and founder of the Black Filmmakers Magazine and BFM International Film Festival in London, sadly departed this earth June 28th, 2021. So please join us right now in a minute of silence to remember the life and work of our mentor, our friend, director, Menelik Chibaz. A minute of silence. Thank you. Amen and so rest in peace. Ooh, I didn't know I would feel that way. Okay. We got that out of the way. Rest in peace, Menelik. Rest in peace. Now I will introduce you to our guest. Colette Harris German is an honors degree arts graduate, British arts graduate. British born, London based professional actress, presenter, live event MC, and panelist and moderator, um, including places like BBC and BFI. She's known for films like Ready Play, Ready Player One, Bad, what's this, Bad Nam? <laughs> and, and, Night, and Nine Nights. She's also the associate producer of Menelik Shabazz's documentary, The Story of Lovers Rock, which she also featured in. Floyd Webb, born in Mississippi Delta and raised in Chicago. Uh, for Floyd's background includes global work in cinema, photojournalism, publishing and advertising. He's a producer and director known for the search for Count Dante, Yusuke San and Daughters of the Dust, which is one of my favorite films. One of the things that made me want to be a filmmaker. So, so you know. <laughs> Sonia Basso, uh, moderator for this evening, was born and raised in London to Jamaican parents. She has served as the operations manager for the High Falls International Film Festival in Rochester, <clears throat> New York, excuse me, marketing and public relations manager for both the Little Theater Film Society in Rochester, New York, and Image Film and Video Center, Atlanta, Georgia, which we both actually worked in. And I can't remember if that's where we met. We still have this conversation as to, <laughs> is that where we met? I think we did. <laughs> yeah. 
So now I can hand over to Sonia. I can finally come off camera and drink some water and I'll come back up. So I expect this to go on for about 35, 40 minutes. And then once you see me come back in, you know that it's time to wrap up. All right, so see you later. Bye. Thank you so much, Margie. Welcome, Paulette. Welcome, Floyd. It's really good to see you and to meet you. Thank um, you. We're going we're gonna to jump right in because I think it's all about the story of Lovers Rock. And so I'm going to ask Paulette, how did this project even come about? And you can go back as far as you want or as recent as you want, but how did it, what made this happen? Well, wow, you're making me really emotional right now, Sonia, to be honest. Okay, so obviously many lecture bars, God rest his soul, is the director, but he was also the visionary and the producer of the story of the Lovers Rock. Menelik was better known for his first feature film um, called Burning an Illusion, for which he won accolades and awards, but never got the wider successes that would come with a successful filmmaker. And it sent him, it just made him a little bit disgruntled for want of a, bit, a better term. And then he had the blessing to travel to Nigeria where he spent some time along with his, his daughter, Nadia. I'm not sure if they were there at the same time, but they both sent, spent time in Nigeria. And it was during Menelik's time in Nigeria that he was exposed, I guess, for want of a better term, of not waiting for um, somebody to help you make your films. You just get on with it and do it. You source your money yourself. You don't ask permission, you just get on with it. And so he came back to the UK with, you know, a big buzz in his belly and, and a vision for what he wanted to do with the rest of his filmmaking career. During that time, there was a big um, Lovers Rock Awards and showcase at the Brixton Academy in Brixton in London, um, for which Menelik shot some of the footage. And it was during that time, and I think it was a, a newspaper article, there's a few bits and pieces that came together to kind of inspire Menelik to make the film. And that's how it came about. That was, um, I think, at the, at, so going back to that particular showcase and awards, Jean Adebayo was um, performing that night. And in fact, it was her last performance in public. And shortly after that, she passed under sad circumstances, let's say. And I think that in itself as well was an additional trigger to Menelik. And to most people, it's like, you know, when somebody passes away, it brings your own mortality into, into the forefront. But not only that, we were starting to lose our greats. You know, since making that, the documentary, we lost Sugar Miner. And, you know, of course we lost, um, oh God, I can't remember her name, it'll come to me. But we were losing the artists and Menelik just wanted to capture these the essence of what we spurned in this country called the lovers rock genre you know and the importance of it and to make sure that it remained as a legacy for not only us who lived it and never really benefited from it okay. um, but also for our children and our children's children there's a situation here in the uk where it, there's this mindset that um african caribbeans and africans don't really do anything because most of the time we've got to do things under the radar because um, the powers that be will not fund us or support us and so forth so we've always got to find a way to make it through right and um, so so that's what we did you know we went into studios i say we couldn't sing a note <laughs> went into the studios the likes of um paulette tanja sylvia teller the whole crew janet Kay, carol thompson so many many and they made their songs. And a lot of them were very young, you know, Kofi, who I think was a part of 15, 16 and 17, they were literally 15, 16 and 17 years old. My and so there was a lot of exploitation that was happening at the time as well. So Menelik just wanted to tell the story because this was a genre of music that went on to influence so many other genres of music, not only in this country, but globally, right. including Jamaica where reggae originated, because for those who aren't aware, Lover's Rock is a fusion of um, Jamaican reggae and American r and I'll stop there for now so you can ask another question. No, that was good, that was good. You know, and I'm gonna open this one up for both of you to answer, and I'm gonna see Floyd, if you wanna take yourself off mute. 
tell me about your relationship with Menelik. Oh my God. That is like. It's a loaded question, right? It's a, it's a really loaded question <laughs> because I, it was never my plan to be in London. I had no desire to come to London. When I left the United States, I was headed to Africa. Europe was a stop to make some more money, but I had no, but at the same time, you know how you see travel posters and you see all this travel stuff about England. You look at that stuff, it's England swings like a pendulum do, Bobby's own bicycles, who cares, right? So I didn't know what was in London was in London, right? So I'm in Paris and I meet this woman from Guyana who's breaking up with her boyfriend in Paris. And we get to talking and she invites me over for the weekend and I come to London. I'm like, holy, sh and she takes me to Brixton Market. And I'm like, I didn't know black people was <laughs> in England like this because they didn't, pop, you know, and, and all the stuff you see, all the travel stuff. And I watch a lot of travel stuff. They just don't talk. About. I was, I was like, I was just, just making, I had just made 20 years old in, right? And there's just so much that I didn't know. You know, I knew all about Africa, but I did not know about the diaspora community in Africa, in Europe, and in England especially. You know, so I just, and, and I had even seen this film. I had actually seen this film called uh, Sapphire, right? They had shown it on TV uh, when I was a kid, right? So I, so I, I suddenly remembered that film Sapphire, which was really interesting, and I had to go back and look at it. So when I got there, I ended up staying longer than I intended. I didn't. I just came for the weekend. I ended up finding a job, a freelance job, and stuff. You know, the woman, the woman kind of, you know, she kind of pushed me along on that. You know, I, you know how it is. Twenty years old, young, and you know, not thinking clear. <laughs> and and um, and I was, and and we went to, and I remember we went to Carnival. You know, she took me to Carnival. She just introduced me to Black England, right? And I'm just fascinated, right? Because and um, and and I started going. I started going down to Brixton a lot because I met this guy. It's crazy. I used to hang out at Keskity Center, right, under this guy uh, Oscar, uh, Oscar whatever his name is, right. And I was living in North London, so um, and they told me, oh, Keskity Center is a place because I, I used to work out. So and so they had a space to work out down there. They, they had theater. You know, it was a lot of stuff. And and I practiced my flute down there. And I met Archie Poole. Who, was, who is an actor who was in, he was in uh, uh, Babylon. He was in a bunch of TV stuff, uh, Ar Archie Poole. And I started hanging out with Ar Archie Poole. And I started, and, and they lived down there. So we used to, to rehearse down in, down in Lad Ladbroke Grove rather. Mm -hmm. and one day I'm going down Goldborn Road because something else happened and I got involved with somebody. I was a photojournalist at the time. And I, and I got invited down to Island Records mm -hmm. and I had to walk down Goldborn Road to get to Island. And Millick is standing outside, passing out people, this newspaper, you know? And we get to talking and you know, Millick is, is a joker. He starts messing with you. He starts teasing you. And we're going back and forth and Dr. Oliver Tato comes by, you know, and, and, and next thing you know, we're like full on, right? And, uh, and it's funny because he's standing in front of an office just like I had when I left, left the state because I was working, he was working for the, uh, the uh, Black Liberation Front, and uh, and the grassroots newspaper was an organ of Black Liberation Front. So so that was a bookstore at their headquarters, and um, and Milnick was like part of that group, and I was part of the National Committee to Combat Fascism. So we had a lot to talk about, you know, and um, and so I started going back and forth, and that's how it all started. It, it started, and neither one of us was filmmakers, but both of us had been affected by portable video. Both of us had gone to, we, there was so much stuff. I was from Mississippi, he's from Barbados. They're dealing with sugar cane. We're dealing with cotton, you know. They even, wait, wait, we even, we even, we even got captive laborers from Barbados shipped off to South Carolina, you know. So we could have been cousins, right? We, we, you yeah. know, I mean, so, so that's how it all started, you know. And, um, and, I, and I had left for Africa, you know, because my, my whole point of being out of the country was to go to Tanzania. And, and I did that, you know, and I came back and I, I don't think I saw when I came back when I was on the way to the States, but um, started working for Chicago filmmakers in Chicago as a projectionist and, and the guy that ran it was, a, that ran Chicago filmmakers was a high school friend and he dared me to make a film. And I did, and I got it out there. And then I came to this, this festival, uh, the, the, um, uh, the uh, Commonwealth Institute Festival. 
the, the very first black fest festival. Um, and Menelik's film was premiering. And I saw Menelik, I was like, dude, you're making movies now? And, and that's how we got back, back together. Nice, nice. You know? Yeah, so, so that, was, that was it. I mean, it, it, was, it was amazing. But, you know, it, but it always struck me. And the thing we were talking about, actually, we were talking about big because we, we started BFM Mag online together. Matter of fact, I worked on BFM Mag itself as a correspondent. I, I work with him on more stuff than I actually remembered until we were talking one day. Uh, we, we had this talk like last spring, uh, spring of 2020 during, during the COVID, you know, my dad was sick and dying and stuff. And he was, and he was talking about how long, we, you know, he reminded me how long we knew each other and how much we had in common. But he was doing this in order to talk me into being production manager on Pharaoh's Unveiled. Right, you you know how Mendelik is, <laughs> you know Mendelik Mendelik starts buttering you up, and then and then, it, so that was 2019 really because I helped him before COVID came. Uh, he shot, I think it was 2019 or was it 20? I can't, can't remember, remember what it was, but if I remember we had just long time. Was oh Mendelik, leave me alone, <laughs> you know, because you know, I knew he didn't have a whole lot of money. I said, oh, okay, okay, Mendelik, and um. And I took that, you know, I, I took that break and went and, and worked, worked with him on, on Pharaoh's Unveiled, you know. But we had been doing stuff off and on forever. He used to bring me over to, to, do, uh, to, to, to do lectures. We were, we got it. Uh, I was involved in digital cinema before a lot of people because I ran a film festival. And I was back and forth to San Francisco and I was, you know, going down to Lucas Ranch and I saw the, the uh, edit droid. And, and so I always stayed on top of that stuff. So I was always passing on that that information because a lot of people back then if, if you remember were saying there was no future in digital cinema right Literally, they wanted to live in jungles of film of like film you know jungles 35, of, 35 millimeter reels 35 and six, yeah yeah you know 100 pound 35 millimeter reels right. shipping. and i'm like i can't wait to get rid of this crap right and oh i hear you and uh, and uh, and so we were we, we were always communicating about technology because when we first met we talked about video because I was working with some people in, in Paris that, that were doing a, a lot of video production. And uh, so technology has always been part of, of what we do. And um, I had invited him to our festival. I started the Blacklight Film Festival in 1982. And, Millick, and, and, and Burning an Illusion was one of the first films um, that we had featured from, from abroad, right? Well, a, along with, with a lot, lot, of, lot of African films that, that no one had seen in at the time. But, but you know, it's interesting because I always tell people, you know, uh, Burning an Illusion is as important to the history of Black British cinema as she's got to have it is to African-American cinema. Right. You know, you've got these nodes that happen. I mean, like uh, after Sweet Sweetback, we didn't really have anything, you know, anything that was really, you know, really that compelling or that had that much impact. And she's got to have it came along and shook things up. Because after, you know, because, uh, you know, Melvin, you know, another good friend of mine, Melvin was just one of those don't, that, that's how Melvin started like that. Melvin did not care. He was going to do whatever he wanted to. And, um, you know, he did Spike before Spike. You know, right. He was already, him, two people, Melvin Van Peebles and Rudy Ray Moore. I'm not a big Rudy Ray Moore film fan, but I'm a Rudy Ray Moore fan because Rudy Ray Moore would come here and he was, and he was that guy who would do exactly like Melvin, which was, do those films on their own, come what may. They would come to town, they would promote the films, and they would stand out, to, like just like uh, Melvin and Rudy Ray Moore would stand outside the theater, like Menelik ended up having to do, and get people to come in and talk to the audience. You know, Rudy Ray Moore is going up and down the line telling jokes, all the jokes from his records, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, Melvin's, Melvin's, uh, Mel Melvin's thing was just being cool, right? Mel Melvin could stand out in front of the theater and just be, 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 be cool, you know? I never got to see Menelik when he was doing his films, but, but, but like we, we, we talked pretty much every day as he was fin finishing things, you know? And, um, but, you know but, it, but it's real interesting to remember the type of film Menelik did uh, with Burning an Illusion a lot of people weren't happy with because of its political content, right? There was there were a lot of positions, there were a lot of areas, and I'm talking about people that, you know, people that kind of it kind of matters to the people who make decisions and things. It was a political film. It said a certain thing that they might not have agreed with, and he kind of got pushed to the back the same way Melvin did, you know, um, and 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 generally, 
we make the mistake a lot of times of thinking like once you do something for the BBC and it's out and it's successful, you think more success comes. But no, you got people that don't like the uh, political message, don't like your politics, don't like the fact that you may or may not be an academic, you know, you know, don't like the fact that um, that that you're not from the same class, mm -hmm. you know, because you have classes within classes within classes within classes, right? And the people who make decisions, you know, tend to go with that. And I know people are going to hate to hear me saying that, but but it's the truth. It's true here. It's true in 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 the UK. It's true in France. And especially wherever we have people from the diaspora that have come through this history that we've come through, right? I, because it's absolutely. like crabs in a barrel. They think. You know, it's like the Highlander syndrome. There could only be one. And the only way you get a hit is cut somebody else's head off, yeah. you know, and and um, and and Menlik. And, you know, because we we had this talk all the time. You know, Menlik was always waiting for that next thing to come from these people who hadn't already given him anything you know, or, or who hadn't brought, brought him anything else. And, and, and that's and that's a lot of people, you know, because they big us up. Right. And. Then when you try to get, when you try to, because film is not a meritocracy, you know? Right. Just because your film was successful doesn't mean that you're going to get to do another film. No, it it's doesn't. About it really doesn't. <laughs> it's about <laughs> who your connections are. It's about what kind of structure, it's really like what kind of infrastructure you build for yourself. And right. you can't build it on the people who you work with, but the, the people who finance your film, you have to build an independent network of financing the way he successfully did 20 years after uh, Burning and Illusion. Right. You know? See, and sp speaking of financing, I'm mm -hmm. interested to know, sorry sorry to cut you, but Paulette, mm -hmm. how did Menelik finance the story of Lover's Rock? Wow, blood how, sweat. How was that done? <laughs> blood, sweat and tears. He put a lot of his own money into it. Yeah. Okay. But he also did um, crowdfunding. But in addition to that, he, we, he, so how I got involved was similar to yourself, Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, I was introduced to Menelik when I was in uni. And then I ended up doing work for the Pan-African Film Festival. I'm their European ambassador or representative. And it was through the Pan-African Film Festival that I was reintroduced to Menelik back in 2003. And so Menelik and I met, and then I then also, similar to Floyd, got involved, started working for the film festival. Menelik commissioned me for my first ever written article when I was doing my film studies with um, Four Corners. It was a course that was run for single mums, of which I was one at the time. And Menelik asked me to write an article about, um, about the course, and he published that in the magazine. So that's how me and him had been going on. And then the, the festival stopped and he started doing um, the story of Lovers Rock. By then I was running my own film screening night called Film and Cabaret on the Broadway, where I screened short films with live productions. And then I heard about the story of Lovers Rock. So of course, with my relationship with Menelik, I invited him to come to one of my screening nights to pitch to my audience. And that's what he would do. He would go to events, you know, with his um, flyers and, you know, the questionnaires and so forth. And the, the pledge sheets where people would pledge X amount of money towards the film and then we would then follow up. And so I said to him, you know, I'd love to be involved, get on board. And the rest is history, as they said, he invited me to come along. I think the first day I shot on with him was the Levi Roots um, interview at Levi Roots's history, uh, sorry, restaurant. So how many let did it, money from his pocket, a few investors, right at the very end, um, we got some big money, not I say big, relative, um, from um, some power companies and so forth. When I say power, electric companies and stuff. I'm not going to say the name. Right. The, somebody that many could bet who had helped him to secure some money, but that was finishing funds for the editing and so forth. I invested. So you had investors, all different ways, you know, similar to what Floyd said. He just kind of forewalled it a little bit to use an American term. Uh, that's really for the showing but then we got our distributor on board but he was coming around to events and just showing what bit of footage that he had a little bit of trailer that he'd cut to kind of whet people's appetite as to what they would be investing in and yeah that's how he did it so people either invested or a, some of the crowdfunding five pound here three pound there literally nice. walking around with a bucket so how did how did the talent get pulled in how did how did he secure all those interviews because they were cool <laughs> exactly like Floyd said, Menelik has this way of, 
yeah, just smiling. And <laughs> people say yes, <laughs> basically. I, I mentioned I, that in his uh, tribute, how he always had a smile. Always a very, very big, huge, Bajan magnanimous <laughs> smile. That was really nice. um, I, I, What I will say is I came on to the project partway through. So how he secured all of the artists, I, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Um, but what I would say, is some of the footage would have been done from that showcase that I mentioned, the award, the Reggae Awards, Lovers Rock Awards and showcase um, held in Brixton. So some of the footage was behind the scenes. A lot of the stage performances were from that um, particular showcase. And sorry, I've worked on two documentaries with men in it. This, the story of Lovers Rock and also Looking for Love. So it's all a little bit jumbled up in my head as to who was in which. That's okay. <laughs> in both. Um, so yeah, so just think about the story of Lovers Rock. God, that was 2010 that we finished shooting it. It came out in 2011. So I'm trying to go back a little ways. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'd be lying if I said, but I know a lot of it came through um, those interviews of the people that he'd met during that showcase. And then people came on board. So if you, for instance, if you take um, uh, Victor Romeo Evans, who features in the documentary, of course, uh, Victor and I think Janet as well, were both in Burning an Illusion. Right. So you already had a relationship with them anyway. Right. So we, well, you, you're from London, so you know we're, we're quite close-knit as right. it is an in the entertainment industry, even more so you know, because everybody's really got to have his, each other's back as much as, as you can. And so we all try to support each other's show as much as we can. I mean, it's a bit of a glut now because all the next generations are coming through, but at the time it was just us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that was predominantly how he secured his acts. Yeah. Oh, nice. All right, and I'm going to ask this question for involved? both of you. I'm sorry, sorry I say that? Who wouldn't want to be involved in such a project? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I know all the nostalgia bells were tingling when I was watching it, even though it is, you know, 11 years later, it's like, oh my gosh, I remember this song. I remember, it's just, just wonderful. So not necessarily from the film or not necessarily from that moment, but give me a really memorable moment with Menelik. Something oh, that stands out. And then Floyd, you can, you can tell me something as well. Oh my gosh, when we would do so many, but one of my favorites, even though it was dangerous, but it was one of my favorites memories. When we were doing the tour with the story of Lovers Rock, we had a big screening in Luton, which for those who are from internationally, it's about, I don't know, I don't even know, about an hour from London. Roughly. I think just under an hour. My sister was born in Luton, actually. <laughs> just under an hour, hour from London, but it was snowing. And it was just me and Menelik in his little rickety blue car. And the car was skidding. I'm like, Menelik, hold the wheel, hold the wheel, hold the wheel. We've got to get to this screening. That was one of my nicer favourite memories. One Aww. of the not so nice ones was having to battle to get the film screened. You know, going to showcases and the posters not being up, the flyers not being on public display, the film not being listed in the telephone listing. So when you call and they say press one for Batman, say mm -hmm. two for Lovers Rock, there was no Lovers Rock, so people couldn't book it. Wow. You know, showing up at theatres and the film not being there and this long line out the door of people who have come to see the film, who've booked the film, but the film's not in the building. It's been really, it was a journey. So we, we had... Him, us, the crew of us who would just tour, like Victor and Janet would turn up at showcases and just put on an impromptu concert at the end of the, of the screening. Wow. We had so much fun. It was, it, we had so much fun. Nice. Floyd, come off, come off mute and give us a, a moment. You're on mute. Yeah, I know. So, uh... <laughs> We were invited to a film to Kenya's first international film festival. We were invited to come and bring films with us to show people, and we showed these films not just in well, actually, we, I don't think we ever showed them in Nairobi itself. They sent us to the provinces, you know, to Kakamega. I went to Kakamega. Uh, Menlik was sent someplace else. Saint Clairborn was sent someplace else. And so we came back and shared these experiences and we never really did it because this was under Daniel A. Rap Moy. It was all suspect actually. But we had a, we had a big meeting of all the filmmakers because there, there, were, there were a lot of African filmmakers there. And um, we had this big meeting in the, in the you've, you, you've seen the, the, in Nairobi, the big Kenyatta center, you know, it looks like a little flying saucer. We were in this big round thing. 
in this conference hall and we were all out there, you know, with, you know, with the interpreters and, and talking about film and um, who was there? Uh, uh, Lionel Ingakani from South Africa, the guy who did, did, did the uh, British film, Jemima and Johnny, and he did a documentary about Hugh, Hugh Master Kaler for the, for the BBC. He was there, he was, he was one of the people that I met when I, I first got there. And, uh, and Menelik raises his hand and he says something. And he says, you know, there's a lot of talk about reparations. And the thing I wanna to present to my African brothers is that we were sold and that not only, we don't think, we, we think that, he said, no, he said, I think that the question of reparations should come from both parties, the parties that bought us or captured us and the parties that sold us. And you could hear a pin drop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it was like, it was like, makes sense to me. And it's like, you, you know, and people were, people didn't know what to think. You know, I'm like, that's, I said, look, the, the, the Asamaka of Suriname said the same thing to the Dutch people. Said, sent us back to the Africans that sold us so we can see what was on their mind that made them sell us, you know? And, um, and so Menlik would do that kind of stuff, right? And people would react to him in a whole lot of different ways. And a lot of times it was people who made decisions who wouldn't, you, you know, they would say, oh, that Menlik, you know, because Menlik was not an academic, right? He was not a, you know, he, he was from working class, right? And this stuff makes, it makes a difference, especially within the black community, right? Mm -hmm. We love the well-dressed preacher driving a fancy car, right? When the, when, when the struggling artist comes along, well, he ain't got no, he ain't got no fancy suit, no fancy car, so he ain't successful. We want to roll with the success. They don't want to, people don't want to roll with struggle. They don't want to help push the wagon. In Mississippi, as we say, they don't want to help you push the wagon up the hill. They want to ride it down, right? Mm -hmm. So we're left on our own. And this is the and this is the story of the politically motivated, awakened, you know, creative that's really trying to make a difference, right? You know, and when you're working in the interest of not, you know, when, when you're working in your own best interest and not somebody else's own best interest, because we are because we are adopted and we're pulled and we're pulled into these circles based on the value that we bring these circles where, where these decisions and all this capital lies, you know. Right. So. So yeah. So. All right. So tell me a little bit about anything that you've got coming up. What should we be looking for? What is what are you excited about that's coming up in the future? And anything that you're involved in or not involved in that you just think we should keep an eye out for? For me personally, right now I'm extraordinarily excited about our new feature film, which we shot during COVID with an all black crew. Um, it's directed, so firstly, let me say, it was consulted on by Menelik himself. He was our consultant during the run up to and during the shooting. And sadly, as we know, he's now transitioned and passed away and no longer with us. However, his legacy runs very, very deep through this film. Our cinematographer, myself, and Carl Curtin, who does our sound, all worked with Menelik on the story of Lovers Rock and also on um, Looking for Love. Our new feature film is called Streets Paved with Gold. Um, it, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. It That's is, what they were told. That's what they were told. <laughs> it is a Windrush generation um, film, but it's intergeneration, intergenerational. It is an adapted film from uh, script screenplay from Victor Richards, who plays our lead in our film, but the screenplay is actually co-written by himself and our director, Suleiman Garcia, um, from Victor's 25 year long run of his one man play of the same name, Streets Play with Gold. Um, wow. We are now searching and seeking and encouraging everyone to support us with seeking um, finishing funds. Um, we have an Indiegogo page, so please look for it. It's on my website, Paulette Harris German. It's on my Instagram, at Lady Paulette. We also have a website, um, spwgmovie.com. And so if you look on Indiegogo for Streets Paved with Gold, directed by Menelik, I wish it was directed by Menelik. Oh, oh gosh, Menelik. Um, oh. 
consulted on by many lecture buyers, directed by Sullivan Garcia, lead actor Victor Richards, who wrote the original play. And I'm producing, um, first ADing and acting in it. And we've got a beautiful little young lady by called Inzinga, who plays um, Christina, um, who plays my daughter. She's 15 years old, so support her, if not us oldies. And let's get this made. This <laughs> It's her first feature film, and we're really excited for her and for the project. Okay. So that's All right. part of that at the moment. Excellent. Streets paved with gold. Yes, we're going to look out for that one. I'll send you Floyd, the link. Please do. Please. Floyd, what are you excited about? What's coming um, up for you next? Well, we've been working on, you know, it takes a long time to get films done. So you're always pushing three or four of them at the same time. So suddenly, out of the clear blue, I've been working on one documentary, The Search Account Dante, for years, but it but it, it had been released online in different places. P people were paying me to actually do excerpts of it, right? And so we, I've, I've been, you know, I got some financing for that with a, with an LA-based production company of some really nice people. I'm not an LA fan, so these are some really nice people, and um and I'm working with them. But at the same time, I work with a South African director by the name of Mandela Dube. Uh, Mandela has a film on Netflix right now called called Kalushi, which is really pre pretty much about that takes place about the same time that I was in East Africa, you know, uh, during the liberation wars. And uh, so we've been working together on a film with a, uh, he's, he's doing a dramatic film on, a, on the African warrior who becomes a samurai. Not the black samurai, but the African warrior who becomes a samurai. Because he arrives in, because what people don't want to accept is that no, he wasn't a slave who became a samurai. He was a seasoned warrior who was the equal of any samurai when he got there, and that's how he got to be a samurai. So that's the story that we're telling. It's telling it first as a dramatic film, which he's, which uh, which uh, Net Netflix is uh, is uh, there in the running to do the financing for it. Uh, we're we're in a you you can see the image behind me. Yep. Which which way? There. Oh yeah, there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, so we've got the feature film that he's he's going to be doing, and then we have a a docudrama, a a, a, a Japan-based docudrama. I've been working with a uh, with a uh, uh, producer in Japan for the last five years, trying to get this docudrama fi financed. Uh, her name is De Deborah DeSnow. She did a a series. Uh, she did a series called Japan Memoirs of a Secret Empire, which is considered the best history of Japan, the best documentary history. Of Japan that that was ever done for P PBS, so uh, and that film is going to is going to really dig deep into the similarities between 16th century Japan and and the rest of the Eastern world, right? Because this is because all a lot of this stuff happens before the coming before the white man came, right? And uh, and this is what people don't really consider that we were really on an even you know the differences. When, when you look at African warriors and you look at the Asian warriors, there's so many similarities. There was so much contact. You know, we were a met the East was a metropolitan world, right? You know, so you you know, like Swah Swahili is evidence of that metropolitan world. You know, from from uh, from like Persia, from from the Arab countries, uh, Indonesia, China. This you know, all of this trade was taking place, and all of this contact was was was, was taking place during those time periods. And this is what people always miss when they want to do films about people like Yasuke. They don't want to deal with the African part. They want to put him right into, right into you know, the easy thing, put him right into Japan, let the, you know, let, let the Japanese lord see him and is impressed by him and take him out of slavery and train him to be a samurai. Well, you don't get trained to be a samurai at, at 20 years old. You either are a warrior or you aren't a warrior, right? And so that's that's one of one of the things that, that I'm really excited about. And another film is a, a doc documentary film called Club de Lisa, which is sort of like Chicago's Cotton Club, but unlike okay. the Cotton Club, unlike the Cotton Club, um, Club de Lisa was not segregated. Black people could go to Club de Lisa, and so black people. So it, it was called a, a, a black and tan club, right? And basically, white people would sneak over there. You know what I mean? Frank Sinatra was there. He met his black girlfriends there. Um, you know, that's where he met Sammy Davis Jr. This place, it, it lasted from like prohibition till like 1958. And it was like a fixture. And it was started by these five Italian guys, these five poor Italian guys 
who were from a, a place in Italy that was just as poor as Mississippi. And they mingled with people who came to Chicago in a great migration and got along well and got along well with, with Al Capone too. And so it's an incredible story with all of these people, black and white, who talk about, you know, and, 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 and unfortunately, a lot of those people have died away because I had, I had 90 year old white women from Minnesota sending me emails. Oh my God, I had such a, I met my first boyfriend there. And oh my, I, he used to smuggle me to Club Delisa. <laughs> he used to put a blanket over me and smuggle me from the north side to the south side, right? All these kind of crazy stories, right, of, of, about, about this place. And nice, we'll know, look for that one. And it, turned out, wait, wait, and it turned out one of the owners, Mike Delisa, he's got all these kids. He's got all these, all these outside children on the south side. And I meet you all the time. It's, it's the craziest story. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. You know? And Sun Ra used to be there, right? That's that's one of my one, one of my childhood heroes. Sun Ra used to arrange music there, right? And oh, wow. so uh, Chicago, uh, Chicago's uh, full of characters. But Paulette, I need a European producer. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 this needs to be a co-production. Co Let's have a conversation, Floyd. Yes, right? definitely, definitely. Okay, so yeah. a connection has been made. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I just want to say that Sun Ra, of course, is Menelik's um, film company name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we, we used to talk about, when we first met, I used to talk about Ra all the time. He said, ah, man, it's crazy. So he ain't no crazy than Lee Scratch Perry. You know? <laughs> That's his soul, right? Because he I'm, just... I'm like, I'm like, both of them dudes are out to lunch. They eat at the same place, so, you know. Yeah, so we need to start wrapping up. Um, sorry for cutting in. So just a few, so I enjoy, even though I was in the background doing other stuff, I enjoyed that conversation. So first of all, I have to give you a round of applause. Thank oh, you very much for that. Thank you very much, Floyd. Menelik, rest in peace. Oh my God. So one of the first things I wanted to say was, we were all talking about your memorable moments with Menelik. And I've told Sonia this story that, the way I found out Menelik passed, I was having a board meeting with my um, board members. And one of my board members, I was excited. I was like, oh, we're showing Menelik's film. And um, I've asked my intern to reach out to him, blah, blah, blah. And my board member came on and said, Menelik passed three weeks ago. I said, what? Wow. So I said, OK, stop. I said, I don't think you know what Menelik is to me, our connection. When Menelik started his film festival, I was right there by his side, huddled up in a room in his office in East London. So all the work I've been doing with film festivals stemmed from my connection with Menelik. Because Menelik was a visionary. This was how many years ago? It was over 25 years ago, when people weren't even thinking about black film festivals. You know? So Menelik, and I'm so glad I got the chance to reach out to him last year. And I had to remind you, I said, Menelik, I said, my film festival life started from you. I just want you to remember that. I said, do you remember that? He said, yes, I remember. Oh, I'm getting goosebumps. So I'm talking about it. He said, yes, I remember that. I, I still can't believe, but you know, his legacy, he left a legacy. He's left a legacy and may he so rest in peace. So that's one thing I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say is Floyd, you mentioned about a woman that introduced you to Black England. And I had a similar experience that I had, one of my cousins was dating an African-American. And from 21, she opened up the world of the African-Americans. So uh, even I, as I went to university in Nigeria, I was very aware of what was going on in America. And I was very fascinated. So that's one of the reasons, well, that's one of the reasons why I am here in America, from that connection. So we, are, we, we connect, we're connecting better. I think that that, that um, yeah. idea that, you know, we have this animosity. We've experienced, we've experienced functional Pan-Africanism, right? Yes, yes. Other people, Pan-Africanism is an idea, it's a theory, right? But we have lived it, you know? Yes. And when I hear these people, you know, you've got this, you know, you've got this, this like, this like underpinning conversation, just like you've got QAnon in the black, in the oh, white community. Please don't mention we've that on here, please. We, you know, we've got this other underpinning of people that are spreading this misinformation about the relationship, about the historic relationship between Africans and African-Americans. There has always been a relationship. 
even though we were here in captivity, there was always a relationship between Africa and African America, right? But people don't want to, you know, they don't want to face this. I mean, like when I was growing up in Chicago, when I came from, from, from Mississippi, I had friends whose relatives who had gone to Ethiopia to fight with Haile, with, with, with Haile Selassie against the Italian invasion, wow. right? Wow. One, of the, one of these guys from, from Chicago, his uncle, um, his uncle was, uh, his uncle was John Robinson. He was a pilot. They called him the Brown Condor. And he, and he helped start Ethiopia, he helped start the Ethiopian Air Force and Ethiopian Airlines, right? Wow. Other, others, others. That's a documentary, right? There. Yeah, yeah. Others of my friends' relatives and some of my relatives fought in Spain against fascism. You, you know what I mean? It, it's like there's all of this history that gets forgotten. And these are the things, and this is what Mr. Me and Menlik have always talked about, about recovering this lost history, these things that, you know, these things that people don't think enough to, or, or like care to think about. Yeah, I'm doing a film about John, 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 uh, about John Robinson. I just don't want to talk about it yet because I got this other stuff I got to do. But films like John Robinson and, and Ethiopia fighting against, you know what I mean? It's a, you know, it's a great feature film, you know, that kind yeah. of thing. Now, this guy was a janitor. He came to Chicago. Well, well, no, he he came out of school. He went to a flight school. They wouldn't let him in school, so he so he got a job as a janitor and observed the classes, right? And basically got on a plane and flew from observing the classes, and that's how he got into the school and eventually became, became a teacher. But not only did he go to Ethiopia, he helped start the Chinese Nationalist Air Force because nobody here, none of these white people wanted to tr train the Chinese pilots. So John Robinson brought him to Chicago and he trained the first pilots, the first Chinese pilots to fight against the Japanese, right? Oh, wow. This wow. is how intense these histories are. And this is the stuff that it ain't hitting. You really just have to pick up a book about flight and you run into this stuff, you know, like when people tell me about hitting history, no, it's just unexplored history because it's not. <laughs> I like that. Okay, mean, so, you have to read a book. That's all. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have some questions from the, the audience. So okay. I, I want us to get to that. Um, before we, you know, our final wrap up. Um, so uh, this question, so give me a minute because I'm going between windows. Um, this question, well, it's a comment and a question from Angela Ryan. She said, excited about the new film, heard about it at Hidden Truth Talk a couple of weeks ago. What has happened to the lover's rock genre? I, ha I hardly ever hear of any new music. Is it me? No, it's not you, Angela. <laughs> Who would like to answer that, um, Paulette? Uh, probably me. Um, I'm on a radio station as well. I do talk radio. So I'm on a radio station called Fresh FM Radio London. We play Lovers Rock all the time. Um, new music. I know um, Lavella Ellis, who is um, Alton Ellis's daughter, she was um, performing, as well as his son, Christopher Ellis. They're still recording. Um, there is some new stuff. It just. It's getting it out there. I think there's such a glut at the moment of so many other music and we're so, you know, we've got TikTok, we've got Instagram, we've got Facebook, we've got Twitch, we've got this, we've got that. I think the focus is just kind of um, dis disparate or whatever the term would be. Um, yeah, I think there's just so many choices now, but there is some coming through but most of us are just listening to what's already there on radio stations such as Fresh FM Radio London and so forth. Um, maybe she'd like to record herself, hey. Yeah, I, want to, I, I forgot to thank the audience for coming. Thank you, audience. And please say hi to them. Floyd was saying hi. Hey, oh, everybody. Floyd was saying hi in the wrong room. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, I think this other question is for... Um, Mr. Webb, could you explain a bit more about the correlation between Africa and Japan in terms of their warriors, please? Just briefly, because we, we have a few more questions. Yeah, it's it's a long thing, but but between, which, but, okay, there's warrior cultures and warrior cultures tend to be the same. You know, one of the things that, uh, what, like during the Sengoku period, which is a period when, when Japan was disunified, the period in the 16th century, when Yasuke got there, before battle, all the Japanese samurai would get together and they would have a party and they would recite poetry, sing songs and act out theater and things. And pretty much that's what Utenzi poetry, Utenzi Swahili poetry, that's what that is. It's the story of great epic battles, you know, from the, from, from the 13th through the 16th centuries. A lot of it, 
was, you know, they say it's an Islamic tradition, but I don't believe that. I think that it's a tradition, of, it's a warrior tradition, period. Because you want to tell the stories of these epics and these epics are performed and they come across in song. So, so when Yasuke gets there and they gets to, to Japan and he's at one of these things, he has things that he can, and, and he's, he's fluent in Japanese, unlike a lot of white people because of the contact, because living in East Africa, he's, he's got the contact. He probably spoke Chinese. He probably spoke all of these different languages from just, from just grow, growing, uh, growing up back and forth, all the trade along the Limpopo River in, in, into uh, Great Zimbabwe, and and uh, and these these different empires, right? So, so 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 that's what it is. The, if you talk to people in Japan now, they will tell you that when they go to Africa, they're surprised at how 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 similar the houses in the country yes, are. Yes, yes, made of thatch, right? Made of thatch. See, you have to leave cities in order to know what a country is. You yeah. can't get up in the Hilton, right, and say I've been to Africa. Yeah, that ain't happening, right? You have to get out in the countryside and be among the people and, and go to the markets and 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 try try to try to try to buy anything in the market, right? Mix <laughs> That's the market itself, right? So it's like um, those experiences between the two countries are only evident if you've been to the two countries in a whole lot of ways because nobody really talks about it. No, not necessarily. Can I say something there? Mm -hmm. So if you look at my name, my full look at my name. Uh -huh. Shonoike. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a real life experience. I mm -hmm. went for an interview at mm -hmm. a job in England, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to name the organization. And mm -hmm. I walked in and they almost fell out. They were expecting a Japanese man mm -hmm. from my name. Mm -hmm. If you go to moji.com, mm -hmm. it's a Japanese site. Mm -hmm. If you look at Yoruba names, they're right. very similar to some yeah. Japanese names. A friend of mine's boyfriend mm -hmm. did his thesis on exactly that. Uh, and he, I he found 250 words in Japanese that were similar mm -hmm. to Yoruba. It's a connection we haven't explored. There's a place yeah. in Jos, in right. the northern part of Nigeria. Right. It's um, a cave. When you yeah. go into the cave, they're drawings of Asian looking people from yeah. like the 16th century. So there has been an exploration right. between the two people. Yeah. We just haven't, it just hasn't been explored. When, when I say that, I have to remember everything, we can't look at any of this through the lens of, of Americanism. Oh, yeah, oh no. Yeah. Through the lens of American race, the lens of American white supremacy. Yeah, because yeah. everything we do, when we look at the outside world, that's the lens through which we watch these things, right? Yes. So when you talk about this kind of research, it doesn't exist in America. It would take somebody like- he, of, no, he, he did his PhD in America. He yeah, went, really, really. But, 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 but wait, yeah, he did his PhD in America, but the rigor of scholarship he achieved in Africa, not here. That's a difference. Okay. That's a major difference, right? If he were educated here, he would never have even looked at the subject. No, 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 no. He's African American. Oh, he's African American. Oh, I thought you said it, it, it was a cousin. Yeah. No, no, no. My friend is Nigerian. Yeah. And the boyfriend was African American. Well, like, like I said, I want to see this thing, but, but, but it's like when, when, when we look at it, like I, like I spent a lot of time with, with Ivan Van Sertiman, and he used to oh, tell yeah. us all the time. He used to tell us all the time. You're, on, you're not a serious historian if you don't speak three, if, if you're not fluent in three or four languages. And the essentials being uh, Latin, Greek, French, German, as well as some African dialects. Diop was, right? Okay. Uh, she counts Diop was, right? And this lack of facility of language is what, is what handicaps us as researchers a lot of times. Yeah, but I mean, we, need to, we, need, we need to wrap up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we need to wrap up. Because we could go on. I would love to continue the conversation. Because I love conversations like this, but um, I'm trying to get to all the questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, okay, I think there's like two more. Oh, what exactly is Lover's Rock? Um, no, and sorry, if you can explain a little bit more about Lover's Rock, Paulette, and then explain the, because the, the documentary actually explores the era. <clears throat> of the 70s and 80s and what was going on in that era in England. So if you can just talk to us a little bit about that yeah. while I drink some water. <clears throat> okay. 
Um, so Lovers Rock, as I said um, earlier, uh, whoever asked the question may not have been on um, when I said it. Lovers Rock is a genre of music that came out of the first born generation of Caribbean children um, born in the UK. So our parents were Caribbean and or African. And we were their first born children in the UK. So as children um, born, I don't know, late 50s, 60s, up to maybe early 70s, we were born into a very white England that did not want us here. If you hear of um, Enoch Powell's speech, The Rivers of Blood, we were chased by um, teddy boys. There were skinheads. Um, we weren't welcome in the churches. We weren't necessarily welcomed in the schools. The schools weren't geared up for working with or teaching, educating children of Caribbean descent. Our parents were from an environment where in the Caribbean, teachers were respected and the teacher's word was law, but the teachers told the truth. Whereas us born here, as I'm sure Sonia will be able to attest to, um, our teachers weren't necessarily on our side as black students or pupils in this case, because it was school. And so we were, so one of the, you'll see in the documentary, one of the things I say is that we, I was told by one of our teachers to take our African drums back to the jungle. And, you know, what do you do with that when your only experience of life was here? I didn't go to Jamaica until I was 12 years old. I didn't know anything about the Caribbean. I knew what I experienced at home. I remember when my dad brought home the Exodus, uh, uh, Bob Marley's Exodus album. Those were my interactions with our current climate. So because we weren't allowed to access a lot of stuff, we found solace in what we were able to produce. So we were being exposed to American R&B, some you know, the, the Marvin Gaye's and so forth. And then what was coming out of J Jamaica, like Tapazuki and um, Uroy and that. And so, and I, as well, Calypso out of Trinidad and Barbados and Soka and so forth. So that all got fused into what we interpreted as lover's rock. So people like Victor, Janet Kay, Carol Thompson, Sylvia Teller, Paul Dawkins, there was so, so many all started coming together and making music to that spoke to us and our experience and our love um, entanglements of, of the day. The film, the documentary itself then took that music and then also backed it up with what was happening socially and politically for us in this country, why that music came about. So the, the riots um, in Notting Hill and Brixton, um, uh, gosh, the sub-educational, there's a TV show on in this country at the moment, um, which actually speaks to children, black children being put in what they called subnormal schools and so forth. So what was happening for us on the streets, but what was happening to our homes, you'll be familiar with the story. Again, Sonia will know the front room. As children, you weren't allowed to go into the front room. The front room had the cabinet, the sofa, the sofa was covered in plastic and only the pastor or adults could go in that room. And if you ever broke anything in that, your neck was on the line and you blame everybody in the world but yourself. So that was the kind of pressure that we were under. So I would encourage people to A, look at the documentary. Sadly, you've missed the screening on um, this platform here with yourself, Mr. Jola. Um, but the film is available on Hulu in America for those who have Hulu and or to rent and buy on Amazon, The Story of Love and Trust. So there are other opportunities to see it. Um, have a look at it. It's a fantastic film and, and Menelik's vision to mesh that film, not only with the music, but with our comedians as well, Rudy Liquid, um, my gosh, who else was in there? My God, they're gonna kill me. John Simmett, uh, Master P. Uh, I think Mr. C was in it, or he might have been in Looking for Love. Just go watch the film. <laughs> That's all I can say, because I'm gonna get myself killed because I can't remember everybody that was in it. Um, brilliant, brilliant film. Um, oh, what is her name? It keeps, it keeps, she died in Ghana. What was her name? Sixth Street, um, Sonia. Oh dear. Yeah, yeah, and why? Somebody put it in the chat for me, please. Her name. Yes. But God rest her soul. I cannot. Oh, remember. I think about Jean. I did. Um, I did Bambo. Oh, that's Jean, Jean Adabambo. She sang um something else. But she passed as well, right? And that's why I was saying earlier. She passed after the the concert that features in the documentary. Oh, that's her you were talking about. Yeah, she took her own life. She took. Yeah, her I heard own about that. Account. Was she Nigerian? She was Nigerian. I believe it was really, really sad. And, and that speaks to what was happening for us socially and politically for so long. 
So a lot of those artists didn't make their, you know, they didn't get their just desserts. They didn't, they didn't get make... their flowers. Yeah, no, not at all. Wow. And life in this country is really, really tough and it hasn't really improved. We've taken more charge of the situation and God bless social media and yeah. you know, the internet and the interweb as they call it. <laughs> the internet. We have more options to promote ourselves and, and do things like this and connect the dots. Um, Uncle Floyd, I'm going to call him Uncle Floyd. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel the same. The one last question. Watch that. Watch that. One, one last question. Um, from Avis Shell. I hope I pronounced that right. Oh, Hi, Paulette. I so love the story of rock, lo Lovers Rock. Do you think a lover rock, Lovers Rock tour can happen anytime soon? A Lovers Rock tour of the music? Wow. Aries Shell, I think, is Ray Shell, a phenomenal musical theatre artist who was in um, Starlight Express and Cats, who's just celebrated his birthday and just written a book. So look out for him. Um, God, yeah, with the money, anything's possible, isn't it? <laughs> anything's possible with the money. I know, so Janet Kay, Carol Thompson, I keep repeating the same name, Sonia, not Sonia, Sandra Cross. Sandra, oh, you're lying, you're lying. <laughs> you know one thing I love about Lovers Rock? Uh, one thing I love about they're Lovers they're Rock. They're all vibrant, they're still all working. Just get your money out, get a venue, pay them, and they will be there. There is, yeah. um, there is an event that happens here most years. COVID kind of put paid to that last year. Um, can't think of his name right now, it starts with O. And it's usually on at the O2 in the, it's called the Giants of Lovers Rock. And there's also oh. there's Paulette Taja, Toy and Adakela, all these greats. And they're still, look, Black Don't Crack, man. We're out here still working hard and looking fabulous. Just book them. Yeah, Lovers Rock needs to come back because, you know, need a revival. The world. And one thing I like about Lovers Rock, or I still do like about it, is the women's voices, how high pitched they are, and they're telling the men off. In such a sweet manner, you're lying. She's not <laughs> shouting. She said, "The man can't even be mad. He cannot be mad." She's like, "You're lying." But you know, in this day and age, you'd be like, "You're lying." N word, um, the B word, and the N word. No, she's just like, "You're lying. You're lying." <laughs> so there's another connection that, um, that comes all the way to Africa, that comes in the African American center from this music, right? From ska. Like the first, the first hint of this music I ever got was a song called "My Boy Lollipop." Oh yeah, "My right? Boy Lollipop," you know, and that was, and that was, and that was uh, Chris Blackwell's first hit record for Island Records. That's led, and that's what led him to see that he could, you know, that he could met, you know, he could met, and he could monetize black culture, right? Which led to him, you know, which led to him pushing reggae really hard, you know, coming out of the Scott thing. This was the, the uh, end, end of Scott. I learned all this stuff living in London, right? You know, hanging out with Kelly Walcott, you know, and, um, and, and when I met Chris Blackwell, he wanted to get in the film and it was through Bob Marley he got into film, right? They came here and started a film company and I was in contact with, with Blackwell all that time. And, uh, and, and some of those films, like, he was the only person to pick up Spike Lee's film. Hollywood had turned it down. Island Pictures picked it up. Had Island Pictures, had, if it was, I always say, if it wasn't for My Boy Lollipop, there would have been no Spike Lee. Because that was the thing. I mean, small then, because Millie's yeah. small. Yeah, we have to. And, 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 like, and, 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 and I can't admit that I'm the one who introduced Spike to Island Pictures at the San Francisco Film Festival, right? Oh, nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, because I was, I, was I was running one of the first black film festivals. From 1982, we, we started the Blacklight Film Festival and brought Menelik in 1983. And, you know, and so we were, so I was back and forth to every major festival around the world at that time, making contacts with people across, you know, all these different, different things and places and stuff. And, um, but yeah, that was, that was really, um, that's, uh, that's, that's the reason I say that the way we do film history is never really complete because we look at it through the lens of America a lot of times and we don't, we're not able to make connections. And somebody like Chris Blackwell from Jamaica makes that crossover to London and exploits, you know, uh, uh, black cultural forms. Well, I, yeah, well, I'm like, well, yeah, I'll say exploit, what the hell. And, uh, <clears throat> and um, you know, we really need, a, need to have a historical understanding of how this stuff takes place, you know, because especially if, if we want to duplicate some of this stuff, and if we want to build our own stuff, you know what I mean? 
You know, I don't want to have to depend on Chris Blackwell to finance my company. This is why I have my own streaming channel. This is the last thing me and Menelik were talking about. I have my own streaming channel. It's called VWCTV.TV. I run a, 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 I've been running a film screening series, a, a, a discussion film series in Chicago since 2005. We've had a, 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 a Afro Futures and film competition since 2007. You know, um, so in Chicago, the whole point was to try to create a, a, a uh, an audience, you know, a literate audience for global black cinema. And that's what we've managed to to, to do here. But Moji, what you're doing there, man, it's so hard to get in here. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Yeah, but go ahead, no, finish off what you were saying. No, I'm sorry, what you're doing there is so unique and it's so wonderful, right? It's It's been really hard to do that. I mean, like when you're the first at anything in this country, I, I never wanted to be the first at anything because all you get is a bunch of shit really for, for, for being the first, right? You basically have to be ready to be that, to be that shoulder that other people stand on, you know, because, you know, because I stopped the film festival next year, I was working at Playboy for you for, for like six, six months. You know, I, I, you know, I was working in all these different places in order to get out of the country and then working at like France Telecom and all yeah. these, that's what I did when I, because the film festival broke me. When my son was born, I had to make a decision. Do I have, can I have one baby or two babies? No, I only had, you know, and now he's 30 years old and happy. And that's what makes me, me happy, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway. So the thing is, I mean, from everything that you, you said, I think things are changing. I think. Oh, they've changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And lots of younger people now are mm -hmm. actually doing the research about our stories, because there are many stories from so mm -hmm. many different parts of the world. As far as Australia, you can pull stories from there, anywhere in the continent, anywhere in the Caribbean, the connections between African-Americans and Africans in the South. I mean, the stories are plenty. And now due to social media, people are more aware. So on that note, uh, one last thing, some inspiring words to upcoming Black filmmakers, upcoming filmmakers, specifically Black filmmakers, because that's the work we do, try to change the narrative of people of African descent. So um, Floyd, Short, upcoming, um, inspiring words for upcoming filmmakers. You want to make a film? Get your cell phone and do it. <laughs> Good. My grandson uses a tablet, and he's and he has his own channel doing Lego animations. Oh right. wow! And he has 110 films doing reviews and animations with his own stories, adding the music, editing. He does it all, right? Anybody can do this now. You can make a film. You can start there, and you can grow. Fantastic. Paulette? I, I, I tell you, Uncle Floyd took the words right out. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, just do it. Just do your vision. Um, there's so much on YouTube. I call it the University of YouTube. Anything you want, excuse me, anything you want to know about filmmaking is on YouTube. Even the um, film schools are saying, mm, do you really need to go to film school anymore? Anything you really want to know. Mm. Network hard. As Uncle Floyd just said, research the history and pick um, somebody who, as a filmmaker, inspires you and study their form. There, there's so much to learn and you can do it. Pick up your phone. Pick up your phone. Pick up your phone. Yeah, pick up and your phone. They'll show you how to do it. It's really there. And edit. you can edit on your phone. Like Uncle said, you could do it all. We can't see it, Uncle. Yeah, <laughs> Uncle Floyd. Uncle Floyd. <laughs> oh, God. Uncle Floyd has brought out the camera now. No, yeah. I'm gonna have a, and then you get cameras. one of these. But start, but start with your camp. Start with your phone, because the phone, everything is on there, and it's very powerful. And you can shoot four four K, and you can edit on your phone. Absolutely. I offered, I offered my grandson a computer. He says, "For what?" <laughs> and yeah. I shut my yeah. mouth after that. Yeah, they're used to smaller devices. <laughs> Start at home. Start with your family. Start recording the stories within your home. You that, know that's who, the most important part. You know, all the people from Windrush, all of these people are dying now. Yeah. Everybody whose people came up here from Mississippi, you got these elderly people. Can't capture their stories now. I got my mom. I got my mom, and I got my dad before he died, and I learned all this crazy stuff. Oh my God, the histories are just amazing. Record yeah. your relatives. For your grandchildren. Yes. For your great grandchildren. Yes. Because ain't nobody else going to do it if you don't. I agree. One last thing, one word to describe Menelik. I'll start. And I know um, Sonia said this is not one word. 
but this is one word in Nigeria. <laughs> Forward thinking. One word. For me, trailblazer. One word. Uncle Floyd, one word. One crazy, word. crazy mofo. <laughs> <laughs> two, two words in, from Mississippi. That's one, word. That's one word. That's one word. That's one word. That's one word. On that note, oh my God, Benelik, I hope you enjoyed this wherever you are. You inspired every single one of us. You will continue to inspire us. I'm grateful to have crossed paths with you and may your soul rest in peace. Lady P, Yay. my sister. And actually, by the way, I was born in London, but I was one of those Nigerians born in London, taking Nigeria at seven, was in a foster home. You know those stories. I know um, them. Um, yeah, uh, Uncle Floyd, I'll send that to you. Um, so, yeah, so we all have similar experiences, you know, where people of the diaspora, really. Um, and we're connecting more. I love that. And the pandemic has actually helped. It has. As crazy as it sounds, <clears throat> the pandemic has helped us. Because, look, look what happened during the pandemic, pandemic the Black Lives Matter. Would, would anybody, nobody could have written that script, right. that there would have been a pandemic and then a revolution at the same time, you know? So things are happening, things are happening. Something else that also happens is we all watch so many more films. We yeah. were all so many film festivals on our sofas, <laughs> under our duvets, just film, play. Just watching, yeah. about learning, 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 learning about the world and each other, you know? And Afrobeat music is helping that as well. Even though Jamaicans will fight you and say, well, no. that music sounds like it's reggae. It's like it's <laughs> so many Jamaicans tell me that. And I'm just like, I'm not fighting with you. We are... but, that, but that's a silly question because we're Africans. So it obviously yeah. came. It's all... And isn't it the more, the merrier? Yeah, it's like sky, oh, right. sky, it's, yeah. it's African exactly. music. It's within our DNA. So yeah. it's just it's a all one, It's all exactly. one linear, it's all one linear progression. It's yes, one it is. On that note, thank you, audience, um, for coming. Thank you, Lady P. Thank you, Mr. Um, Uncle Floyd. Thank you, Uncle Floyd. Thank I you. I don't know if I like this Uncle Floyd thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna take it back. I'm gonna take it back. I, I cancel Uncle. Look, we if we're showing you your respect, Uncle. Absolutely. Floyd. That's so all good. it is. You're Embrace so your elderliness. No, no. I'm My embracing mine. I tell people to call me an elder because I'm an elder. I've reached that stage. Look, what am I okay, elder, elder sounds good, but I ain't know. <laughs> well, in Nigeria, oh, 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 oh. You, you know this, Floyd. In Nigeria, I can't call you by your name. Yes. But people will think I'm rude. So, I, you know, so you're Uncle Floyd. Um, okay, let's, let's, let's make it funky. Uncle Flo. You like that better? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Uncle Flo. What's up, Uncle Flo? Oh, Lord. But, then, but, but then I have to have bars and I don't have any. Okay. No, don't worry, I'll, I'll bring the bars. I'll bring the bars. <laughs> so on that note, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. We have one more Q&A with Mr. Apollo, who is the historian of the Apollo Theater and the tour guide of, of the Apollo Theater. The film, is it still? No, I think all the films have stopped showing, if I remember correctly. Um, but like Lady P said, you can get, um, did you mention this already? about seeing Benedict's film on Amazon, Hulu, and I think yeah. on YouTube, the paid, the paid YouTube. Um, on oh, YouTube, on the Hulu, and um, Amazon Prime for buy or rent. Yeah, for buy or rent, yeah. Um, and then, you know, please follow us on social media. We're at African Film Arts. Our website is africanfilmartsfoundation.org. We have an upcoming film festival um, coming up, the African Film Festival Atlanta which is November the 19th to the 21st. Our call for submissions are still open to September the 30th. And then we're going to make the announcements of the film selection and have our wonderful festival, fingers crossed, a hybrid version. Okay. Hopefully opening night and closing night somewhere, which I'm kind of excited about, but we'll see. You know, we need money. We need money, yo. so all you money people out there, I'm a Nigerian woman, we need money. So it's <laughs> money, African Film Arts Foundation. That's the PSA. But anyway, so um, most of the films will be shown online. 
but we're hoping to have a hybrid, you know, at least be out there, even if it's just in our cars. So thank you again, everybody. Um, this is recorded, so if anyone that hasn't been able to see it, we'll be able to see it on our YouTube channel. And also check out Black World Cin check out blackworldcinema.net. We are having a bi-weekly film series. Our film series online is called Black Militancy and Revolution in Film. And we've been showing a number of films which was inspired by the film uh, Judas and the Black Messiah in order to oh, yeah. in, in order to really examine the culture of betrayal that exists within our movements, right? So <laughs> well, it's about the haters. <laughs> No, this is a real thing. I mean, a uh, uh, Cabral. Uncle Flo, Cabral. is a joke, Uncle Flo. Hey, you know, look, it's too much. Revolution. I've been through too much of this stuff. I see too many people die, so it's hard to joke. Oh. I know, I know, I know. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Uncle Flo. Uncle Flo, you need to roll with the flow, Uncle Flo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, I know that, Sonia, you're looking fine. I just wanted to say a quick call yeah. to my people about the um, streets paved with gold, just to check out my in Instagram bio, and the link is there. Send the me the information. Me. We'll help you publicize it, too, OK? All right. Au revoir, everybody. Thank you very much. Call it. I'll be, call it, I'll be in touch. Thank you, Floyd. Absolutely. OK. All right. Uh -huh. All right. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you so much. Thank you.